You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Mm. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays, or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. OK? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library, and you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977 and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense, and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving, and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres, and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces. And it has a thousand staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building, so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement, where you'll find the cloakroom. And to the left of that, we have the information desk, where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours, and anything you need to know, if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor, we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the King. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one. <laughs> so we'll be visiting that first but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that.
The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor, and in the right-hand corner, you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section, and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. As you listen, answer the questions. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars, $35,000 to $100,000 a year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since 2000, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow, the main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helps explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class, offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare and buying a home. Look at questions 24 to 30. Mr. Obama told Congress and the public, Still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender white appeal. The definition here starts at $35,000, which is about 50% higher than the official poverty level for a family of four and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than $100,000 consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people. However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle-class life. I would consider middle-class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college, and can have vacations and entertainment, said Christine L. Owens, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 32 to 41. You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favorite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a chemical commonly used to add flavor to salty or sour-tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid, or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908 but Eastern cooks have been using glutamate-rich seaweed as flavoring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms. Bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavor of food. Foods often used for their flavoring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, 
which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavor of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savory, broth-like or meaty taste. Umami may be the fifth basic taste, beyond salty, sweet, sour and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savory taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy, and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavors in a variety of foods such as meat, poultry, seafood, and vegetables. While MSG harmonizes well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods. Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8% MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavor. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavor of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavor. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome quality food and good cooking techniques. MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavor of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30%. But food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as 1 to 2 percent. Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use, but for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. You now have half a minute to check your answers.